So yeah, thanks uh, Bruno and Pali for organizing it. I think it, I'm very happy to be here and uh, explain a bit about quantum computing. I'd like to stress something that uh, Bruno said, like it's very good if people have questions, so ask them on the fly and then uh, let us make this as interactive as we can. And my goal here is not to explain a lot about uh, what was the research that we're doing currently in quantum computing, but more mostly explain the basics and, and give a, an idea of the panorama that we have uh, on the tour. And uh, to do that, uh, let's start uh, going to the 19th century. And uh, actually, this is what physicists realize that the classical physics is not sufficient to explain the world. They, they came up with a, a lot of uh, experiments, such that the, the results of the experiments could not be really explained by, by the physics, by the theoretical model that they have in them. And just to give an example, or explain a bit about this Max Ender uh, interferometer. And uh, this is an experiment that uses these three uh, components, like a, a photon emitter. So we just have a, we have a source that creates a, a photons. And you have this object called mean splitter that when you, uh, when you put photons on the left, then it splits the photons to the uh, like up and to the right, and like right away. And uh, you, you can check that the photons are, are, are there because you use this photon detector. So you put a photon detector here, photon detector here, and you see that half of the times they come here and half of the times they come here. Okay, the same thing is uh, the other way around. If you have this photon emitter, that comes uh, like below this uh, mean splitter. Again, half of the photons will come up and half of the photons come to the right. Okay, so this is just to explain these components. And then what you realize that if you plug in all of these um, uh, uh, components together, so we have this photon emitter, these beam splitters, and mirrors, and mirrors just reflect light. And what I uh, would expect is that if you emit a lot of photons into this beam splitter, as I said, what it should happen is that uh, half of it should go up, and then the mirror just uh, reflects it to the second beam splitter. And again, this second beam splitter would split it in two, and half of them would go up, and half of them would go to the right. And one would expect the same thing that uh, the half of the photons that came to the right in this first beam splitter the mirror will reflect them as well. And again, they should uh, go half, the, half, half of them go up and half of them could go to the right. So if you had this uh, classical explanation of this experiment, that would do what we would like the, uh, to happen, like this is what we expect it to happen. But when you put things in practice, they, uh, the, what, what you have is 100% of the problem that you create, they come to this, uh, to this second photo detector. So uh, none of them go up as you would expect if you explain this, uh, this experiment classically. Okay? So experiments like these, they, they, they show that we need a different way of explaining the world. Like we need a different way of explaining how, how things work this microscopic way. And then uh, it comes what we call the first quantum revolution, when a lot of smart pieces, they come together and collectively propose what we call today as quantum mechanics. And this revolutionize how we see, uh, how, how to describe uh, like physics in the atomic and subatomic level. And for example, uh, with, with this new theory, there are a lot of uh, uh, properties that are counterintuitive for us because in the macroscopic level, we do not see them. But for example, that there is this uh, duality between uh, like that what light is, is it a wave or is a particle, and then there is this duality because it belongs as, like it behaves as both of them. Or for example, they realize that uh, physically it's impossible to measure two uh, two properties of a, of a photon. For example, its speed or its position at the same time. So this is not about uh, the tools that you use to measure these. Uh, these properties is just that there is a physically uh, barrier that, that uh, forbids us to, to, to measure both of them. And, uh, and uh, this, proper, this, um, this theory of physics, so it, it uh, got a lot of new concepts and it allowed, uh, like from the physics perspective, 
to, to create new materials, to study new, new, new objects, and so on. But we're not in a physics lab, in a uh, computer science lab, right? So, So a few decades later, people realized that one could also use uh, these quantum resources, so, so these quantum properties of, of matter, in order to do some sort of a computation. So back in '68, uh, Wiesner, like in, a, in a insight, he 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 realized that one could use properties of quantum state that cannot be copied uh, in, in such a way that you can create a scheme for for uh, for have money. So so you, you have, would have a um, a bank that creates uh, some, some deals and so on, but using now quantum quantum states instead of using paper or metal, and this uh, and this uh, scheme for quantum money, you could prove that money cannot be forged. So today, if you have paper, we have a lot of uh, uh, ways of trying to to permit people to to, to create your money, like to, to copy a bill. To a second one, but physically it's always possible to copy every atom and having two copies of the same money. But here he uses the, the properties of that quantum states cannot be cloned, and we'll see this later, to, to show that uh, actually quantumly there are ways of creating schemes of money that cannot you can prove that you cannot copy them. And then okay, but this uh, when Wiesner proposed this, uh, he was seen more as a crazy guy, but this guy doing like nobody accepted it at that point and later uh just in the 80s where, where people came back to, to using quantum resource to do computation that uh, this became more and more uh, uh accepted and uh the, the turning point is like this uh idea that Feynman when he was studying how can we use classical computers to simulate quantum systems and uh, as we see later, there is this exponential blow up of quantum systems. And uh, when he was studying this, he was uh, conjecturing that uh, classical computers cannot simulate quantum systems. And uh, to, as a response to that, he then th uh, thought, okay, why don't you use then quantum states as, as a computational power to then simulate quantum systems? Like, why can't you use quantum properties of matter to simulate quantum systems? And this is. Uh, seen as uh, like the, the birth of quantum computing uh, is, uh, and, and then uh, since then the, the, the field has evolved up. So since then, uh, new, uh, new protocols for, for quantum cryptography, for example, quantum distribution that you see later, and, um, and uh, more new. Uh, like uh, algorithmic techniques, uh, they appear uh, like in the 80s and, and the 90s, mostly like most uh, quantum the main quantum algorithms appear then. But then since the 1000, uh, the, the, the field exploded. And now we have, uh, so this is just a comparison. Like uh, this is a picture from QIP, I think uh, 2000, when you, where you can name everyone in the field, 60 people. And this was the last conference in 2019, where I don't know, even half of the community was there, and we were I don't know, seven, uh, 700. So this is just uh, to give a, a perspective of how, how the how the field exploded in, in uh, since 2000. And the idea is that we have uh, um, we have achieved like. The idea of quantum computing is trying to, to study how quantum, uh, quantum resources can help in different tasks. So it could be algorithms, it could be cryptography, but it could be networks and so on, like game theory. And uh, the idea is that with quantum, we can try to revisit every topic that we study in computer science and then study how quantum resources will help. And uh, this is okay. What I said, uh, said a bit of, is about theory, like how to propose uh, protocols, how to propose algorithms, and so on. But uh, the question is okay, you, we can create a crazy computational model, uh, but 
how, how can you put it in practice, right? So the important part is, uh, are we going to see a quantum computer in, in the 50 years or not? And uh, this is a delicate question, but for example, when we talk about quantum communication, quantum cryptography, this is already a reality. So for example, to do quantum distribution, there are products in the market that, that, are, that uh, enable us to do, for example, uh, exchange keys between uh, a pair of nodes. And uh, when we talk about quantum computing, things are less clear, but uh, we see a constant progress on, on uh, the development of quantum devices. We are not there, we are far from being there, I think, like to have a, like a full scalable quantum computer, but uh, we start having devices that cannot be classically simulated. So we have this, uh, what they call quantum supremacy or quantum superiority claims. For example, we had uh, one in 2019 by Google. I think we had two last year by, uh, by, uh, by Chinese groups. And the claim is that they have a device that they can, okay, we have some indications that no classical device no, can, can uh, simulate the behavior of, of that quantum device being done by, by, by Google or by the Chinese groups. The point is the behavior of the device is not useful. So it's just about sampling from, from a specific distribution. And one can prove that the cl classical computers cannot sample from the same distribution. So this is mostly, this is not, uh, this type of, of, of techniques is mostly to say, okay, we can master this technique to, to try to, to have something useful in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, this is one way that we can try to go there. There, there are other people trying to directly build uh, full scalable quantum computers that will allow us to put all of these algorithms and protocols that we have in practice. Yep. Sorry, what does it mean that the device, like you said that there are devices that allow us to repeat things like um, yeah. quantum computers, but what does that mean if there are no quantum computers? No, 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 it's not quantum computers. Okay. Uh, we see a particle, the, the point is, for example, to do key exchange, the, the, te the technology that we need is much simpler. Like you don't need to do a lot of computation, it's just to, so very simple quantum states, and I'll describe the protocol later, like uh, I'll give uh, the concrete uh, protocol today, uh, but uh, you have to send very simple quantum states over a, a fiber. So this is what you need, and this we know how to do today. Like uh, uh, even LNE, like in her lab, she, she can do QKD and, and send these simple quantum states. So this is the type of technologies that are already available to us. Other questions? Am I speaking too fast? No, it's fine, okay. So yeah, this is just a, an intro to like how, how the field is now, and now I'll get into more details, like what, what it means to use quantum resources, what do, does it mean to, to perform quantum computation. Okay. And uh, in order to explain quantum computing, one would have to go through various uh, postulates of quantum mechanics. And uh, the first postulate tells us how, how can we define a quantum state? So what a, a quantum system is. Um, then uh, once you have a quantum state, you have to see how we can uh, retrieve information from this quantum state. And you see that uh, it's very different from uh, our, I don't know, classical information or you can read it multiple times. Like uh, quantum measurement, it has uh, some effect onto the, on, onto the state that you're, that you're reading these properties from. And finally, how can we evolve uh, quantum systems in time? Okay. And uh, my choice here, since we're all computer scientists, I think uh, I won't define uh, this from a physical perspective, but from a computer science perspective, tailored to the application that we want uh, in quantum computing. Okay. Maybe I can. <laughs> Um, oh, does it change for the for the recording? It doesn't. Okay, so, okay. 
So the first, uh, the first thing that we need to, 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 to describe is how you define a quantum state. And uh, from quantum physics, we have that a quantum state is, uh, is represented by its unit vector on a complex Hilbert space. And uh, we will define a, a, a very simple and very specific uh, type of quantum state, that is what we call a qubit. And this is just a quantum state where you have just two levels. And to define a qubit, uh, as I said, okay, we need uh, this complex Hilbert space. And when you're talking about qubits, you're just talking about C2. So you have complex numbers in two dimensions. And once you have a Hilbert space, you can also define a, a computational basis or sorry, a basis for this uh, for this Hilbert space. And uh, here I'll call this computational basis as a standard basis like one zero and zero one. Okay, so this should be nothing new for you. And a qubit, so it's just a unit vector in Hilbert space. So it's just a superposition or like uh, like this uh, linear sum between. Uh, these two basis vectors, so it's alpha t0 plus beta t1, or alpha and beta are complex numbers, such that uh, their norm square is equal to one. Okay, so uh, a qubit is just this, like right? this, uh, this vector in the silver space that has unit norm. Any question? So this is a qubit. But, okay. In quantum computing and in quantum physics in general, we don't use this notation for, for, for vectors. And uh, this is how I'll call a vector. So a vector C is what we call a cat C. So this is the same thing as we have before, but just with a different notation. Okay. And uh, for the computational basis, we denote like this uh, canonical state, uh, like this, this uh, basis one zero as like this cat zero and cat one as a uh, vector zero one. And uh, this qubit is now this cat C, uh, that is this superposition alpha zero plus beta one. Okay, but again, it's the same thing as before, it's just a different notation. We have a <coughs> vector that ha uh, has unit norm um, in this uh, two dimensional Hilbert space. And alpha and beta, they're called the uh, amplitudes of this quantum, like the amplitude corresponding to zero and the amplitude beta B is the amplitude corresponding to one. Okay, this is just some notation that we uh, use today. Any question? Uh, of course, uh, some maybe obvious uh, remarks. First of all, thing is that uh, the choice that you have this computational basis is arbitrary. So this is the most convenient basis. But we could choose any basis B0 and B1 and write psi as alpha prime B0 plus alpha alpha structure plus beta prime B1, where uh, the norm uh, squared of this alpha prime and beta prime is equal to one. Just and this will be useful later. Yes? Why is C2 not L2 or C2? Sorry? C2 here? Yeah. So this comes um, okay. Uh, in practice, we just need real numbers. But if you want to define, uh, I, I didn't define everything uh, so far. Like when you're defining, for example, quantum evolution, then you have unitary operations, and there you need complex uh, complex numbers for for the following reason. So imagine that you want to assume that every quantum operation, like the evolution of quantum state uh, for a time t, it can be composed in two smaller evolutions of type t over two. Okay? And then if you want that your quantum operations that have this property, then you need complex numbers for that. Like you, you need, the point is you need to take square root of, of uh, arbitrary matrices, and then, uh, and then uh, you need complex numbers for that. But in practice, like I rarely use complex numbers. So real numbers are mostly good. Other questions? Okay, so just to recall, so we have sometimes it's useful to write these uh, states psi using different bases. 
and probably you'll see some application, some some cases where, where you need this selection. Okay, so but uh, other than that, this is like like this is just this unit vector in this unit space. And uh, okay, this, this is from a computer science or at least a theoretical point of view. But the qubits, they are the point is you can model uh, quantum objects like uh, physical objects using qubits. For example, if you have uh, a trapped ion, it has different. Uh, uh, energy levels, and for example, you can consider the ground energy, like the ground state of this trapped ion, as uh, cat zero, and the excited version of uh, excited uh, level of the trapped ion as cat one. So the, the, the point is, that you you have a mapping between this theoretical logic and uh, implementations of things uh, in, in real physical systems. And just a disclaimer: I'm a computer scientist. I barely know these things, and uh, I will try to. Probably what I'm saying is everything that I know from it. So yeah, <laughs> if you need more physics, we can talk to my colleagues uh, that uh, ask questions if you want. Okay. And just to uh, compare with uh, with uh, other things that you have seen before. So when you have a bit, then you just, uh, then this just, uh, uh, you can see it uh, having a discrete value zero and discrete value one. Then when you have this uh, probabilistic bit, so you, you have zero, let's say, through the P and one through the P one minus P, then you can see this as a, as a line between zero and one, right? So, so what's the probability that you have zero and what's the probability that you have one? In this case, it's a line. And, uh, but then going to qubits, like, First of all, you have two dimensions because of um, uh, like you have this two dimensional Hilbert space. But on top of that, you have complex numbers. So this gives us a third dimension. So this gives uh, like this sphere of all possible values that you have uh, in a cube. Okay, so we gain somehow this uh, extra dimension of qubits. But more than that, it, uh, <coughs> as you see later, uh, it's probably with probabilistic bits, actually, uh, you're sampling from a distribution, but then the value is fixed, right? So if you have zero for the p and one with which one minus p, once you sample this value, the value is fixed. And uh, the important part of the qubit is that uh, you, you have both of them at the same time. So you have the superposition of zero and one, and both of these uh, elements in superposition, they're important, and they might, uh, they might, uh, they, 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 they move. Influence the, 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 the outcome of the function. We have numbers for a and b. Just the size of this uh, sphere on one, uh, yeah. on one surface, but what it means that when it's an a and b, you can also like, change the uh, We mean when you use complex numbers? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the point is, you can think, yeah. If you put zero <laughs> here and one here, then, uh, then for example, this uh, equator here is about the superposition of zero and one, but with this complex phase um, consider on that as well. So this vector coming out here would be, for example, zero plus i uh, one, uh, everything over one of the square root of two. So you, you can, you can like, if, you, if you stay in this, like in, in this 2D two, two thing, just uh, like the, uh, the reals, but then uh, when you start to have the third dimension and you put uh, complex phases on, let's say, to one. Does that answer your question? It is, but I'm not sure why you should uh, use <coughs> complex numbers for A and B and maybe you can explain the benefits. Or is it just a physical phenomenon that has some phase uh, change of the photons? And no, no, no. Uh, okay. First of all, it, it has a physical background. So, so if you have a polarization of photon, then you have three dimensions. But on top of that, uh, there are results. It depends a lot on what you're talking about, like what's your application. For example, to do algorithms, you can prove that you don't need complex numbers, that everything that can be done with complex numbers, you can, you can have a different way that you use only real numbers. Uh, but on the other hand, if you use, if you short resources, so for example, if you have just one or a pair of qubits, then complex numbers, they might play a role. And then, and then uh, people have proven that complex numbers are necessary for performing some tasks. 
So it really depends what you're, what you're doing. Okay. In general, if, you, if, you're, if you're not charting any resource, you have, if you're able to have more qubits, then usually you can simulate with more qubits and that's fine. And that's usually what I do. I don't care about common samples. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you also need complex numbers to, to be able to, um, okay, I'll talk more about it later. Yeah, I'll talk more about it later. Any other question? And just some, okay, just some examples. So as I said, we will have okay, uh, we have the state zero and the state y like this is the canonical one zero vector and the canonical zero one vector. But we also have the superposition, the uniform superposition over this uh, vector. So we will call the state plus as the one over square root of two zero plus one, and the state minus is the one over square root of two zero minus one. And of course, I use as an exercise to show that these two are valid qubits. So the norm of uh, of the amplitude squared, sorry, the square of the norm of the amplitude, they sum up to one. Uh, and these uh, these uh, plus and minus they form a different basis for for the silver space. So they're all for they are for their orthogonal as well. And uh, they are very important because somehow they are what you call the one zero and plus minus, they are in the complementary basis. Because if you see, like plus and minus, they are just like the plus is just in between one and zero, and minus is the same uh, in between zero and minus one. So this um, this will give us a very important uh, uh, properties that, uh, for for example, one cannot distinguish between plus and zero with priority one. And again, we we'll see that later just. Trying to give you with the geometrical uh, intuition about that is that the point is zero and plus, they are not orthogonal. So, so in principle, they cannot be the distinguished where you want. And again, you can uh, choose arbitrary quantum states. For example, one, one important uh, state is this pi over eight state. It's just cosine pi over eight zero plus sine pi over eight one. As I said, you can go also to this complex, uh, like you can uh, start adding complex bases, and then you cannot, uh, you don't buy this uh, display anymore. You need to go to this side dimension. Okay, so far so good. So this finishes what I wanted to say about uh, like how to define a quantum state. And now we we'll talk about how to uh, read information from quantum states. So for example, if you have this quantum state C that is alpha zero plus beta one, uh, one, one thing that we, uh, one way of reading its value is by measuring the international basis. So, uh, this means like uh, the, the, the procedure that allows us to extract the, the, the information of C in the computational basis, it tells us the following. Um, when you have this state, you have as outcome the value of zero, whose probability uh, norm of alpha squared. And in this case, the state is not C anymore. Like when you, when you do this measurement and the outcome is zero, then the state collapses to the state zero. So you lose the information that you had before, and they say to become uh, like just get zero. Okay, so there is a collapse of the wave function or the collapse of this quantum state. Or on the other hand, you have uh, one with where the pp squared, uh, normal pp squared. And again, this, uh, after, uh, after having this measurement and having this outcome, the state will not be C anymore. It will be psi anymore. It will collapse to the state one. Okay, so, so measurements, they, they, they disturb the quantum state. Is the measuring similar to sampling in the, let's say, the classical world? No, because in the classical world, the, the sample, the, the, the point is uh, here you can choose to measure. So the point is, if you don't do anything to it, you have the same C type. But when you did, like you decide to measure, 
then this sampling is, is performed. Wait, what I want to know is, is there, a, is there another way of, is there a concept of sampling that is different from measuring? Or is there- Well, there, there, there is a different type of evolution of quantum states that's not measuring. I'll talk about it later, like uh, about unitaries. And then you don't lose information. Then you don't have this collapse. Mm -hmm. And then and then having this superposition will, will really, will be really different of okay, having- so that would be more closer. Yeah, the, yeah, this is no, no, this is closer to classical sampling. Like, the, the, this, yeah, this is much closer to classical sampling. But the point is, instead of having classical sampling, you could keep the superposition and evolve it in different ways. It, here, doing the measurement, I, I have a, I have this superposition and I decide to collapse it, I decide to, to, to make a sampling out of it. Before you were saying that we can express uh, uh, and you can we can use several bases, mm -hmm. but here the state seems to be important, right? Because it's the state oh. in which we collapse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here I'm talking about reading these in the computational basis. In the next slide, I'll talk about generalize this. So okay. the point is there is a choice. Of, okay. Okay. You, Just as spoiler, there's a choice of bases. So we decide to measure the sub bases, okay. and then the outcomes depend on these bases. Okay, but here I'm focusing now in the measuring the computational base, like the standard measurement that we want. And was the phase before the measurement that we talked about? Mm -hmm. And do we know, can we somehow fabricate a series of a specific base a specific base and this? Can we first get a bit louder? And we fabricate a series mm -hmm. that has specific bases? Yes. Okay. In principle, yes. You don't, and that that that's a the, that's a big problem, right? So the problem is, uh, if, if you choose the right basis, then you have the. Uh, I have some examples later. Then, then you have uh, some outcome with certainty with zero to one. But if you have the, the wrong basis, you just have a random value and information is lost because then you collapse the state, you, you never know what A and B are. So the, the point is that if I somehow pick A and B at random, so it is a random quantum state, and you have just one measurement, you don't know the basis, you, you, you won't be able to, to, to discover what A and B are or alpha and beta are. So this is something that, uh, yeah, that's something that, okay. It is, it is bad, but that's how we use it for cryptography. Somehow you hide the information in A and B, and uh, if you don't know the basis, this information is completely hidden. Questions? So let, let me just give an, uh, some examples. So for example, if you have the quantum state zero, right? And we measure particles through, then you have our outcome zero with zero to one, and the post measurement state is zero, and you have one with zero to zero. Right? The point is you 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 have some state in some basis, and if you chose the right basis, then the the, the outcome is determined. The interesting part is when you have superpositions. So, for example, if you have the state plus, that is uh, the square root of two zero plus one over square root of two one. Then, and you decide to measure it in a computational basis, then you have zero, which you already have. And then your, your, your superposition collapses and your post measurement state is just zero. And, or you have one, which you already have, and your post measurement state is one. Okay, and then, uh, so you see that if you have the state plus and you measure it in this uh, complementary basis, then you have, uh, both outcomes we already have, and, and you have no clue of which state it was at the end of the day. And uh, what is interesting is that not only this happens with plus, but with minus. So if you have a state minus that just changes this uh, plus to a minus here, you have the same probabilities, uh, outcomes as you had a plus. So we have zero for the half, and your post measurement state is zero, and you have one for the half, and your post measurement state is one. So, 
So this means that these two states that are orthogonal, they cannot be distinguishable if you just measure in the conceptual basis. Okay, because again, this is just the wrong basis to measure. So that's what, what you know realize, and then okay, we have to have a more general way of doing measurements, and then uh, and this more general way, not only it's not the most general way of doing measurements in quantum mechanics, but a, a different way of doing that is by choosing mazes. So you have the freedom of choose Bzn and Bi such that they are orthogonal. And uh, and what we can do is uh, measure the state psi according to the Bz of the one basis. And the most the, uh, the simplest way of doing that is just writing C in this Bz of the one basis, and then you have alpha prime and beta prime. And when you measure psi in the B basis, you have B0, which, uh, the outcome B0, which is the alpha prime square, the norm of alpha prime square, and then the state collapses to, this, to the state B0. And uh, you have as output B1, the, uh, the, uh, with probability P, uh, the norm of beta prime square. And in this case, the state collapses to the state B1. Okay, so the same thing as we had before, but just for general. Basis B0 and B1. So instead of having compressional basis, we can choose uh, this plus minus basis. And uh, now when you measure zero, and uh, you can uh, check that zero can be written as one over square root of two plus plus minus, then now what you have is that you have uh, basic plus with word we have. And in this case, the post measurement state is plus. Or minus per you have, uh, and in this case, the post measurement state is minus. And something similar will happen uh, with the state one. Okay. So if, if you measure one, that is one over square root of two plus minus minus, you have the same uh, outcomes uh, as, as you have zero. But on the other hand, if you measure plus, uh, then you have as outcome plus, which will be one. And the post measurement state does not does not change, and the same thing for minus. Then you have the, the out, as outcome minus, and um, and the, uh, the 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 measurement won't won't collapse this state because it, it was already in one of these basis states. Is it clear? So it's just okay. This is the important part is that. We need to know the basis if, if you need uh, some meaningful outcome from your um, uh, from your uh, Okay, this is the, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Can we imagine uh, recovering uh, the full information by uh, making several measurements in several bases? So, if you have access to multiple copies, then you can. But if you have a single copy, then you cannot do that. And if we make a measurement in, in the zero one base, and then uh, uh, we get a state uh, zero one, and we use this state in another. I know because we lose the information. No, no. So okay, the you can do it once. Okay. For example, if you have say plus, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. just switch between plus and minus, then you cannot do that. But but of course, if you give it multiple yeah. copies, then you can do something more, and then you can. Do when you decide to do the measurement, you choose it. So this is a parameter that you choose. Okay, so, so for example, you can think about classically, you choose to do a computation, so you choose the, the gains of your classical circuit, right? So quantum, you also have, the, okay, we'll see about the gate, quantum gains later, but you also have a choice in quantum state of doing what's the basis of the measurement. So, so you're free to choose what, when you're doing the measurement, you're free to choose whatever you want. Of course, then, then there are implementation issues, but uh, for now I'm sitting them under the rug. For questions? Okay. And now, finally, we uh, I'll talk about the evolution of quantum states, and this is how we do computation on quantum states. Okay, 
And uh, this postulate of quantum mechanics says the evolution of quantum states is described by unitary linear operators. So uh, recall on uh, linear algebra. So if you have a linear operator, it's just that you have a matrix, right? And uh, a matrix being unitary, it just says that uh, u um, times u dagger is equal to u dagger times u is equal to identity. And a uh, dagger is just operation where you, have, you transpose the matrix and then you take the complex conjugate. Okay, so this is saying that unitary operations, you have that the, if you take the transpose, and the complex conjugate of every term of, of, of every entry of this matrix, then you have the inverse of your matrix. Okay, this is just the definition of unitary matrices. And one important property of unitary matrices is that uh, for every vector, if you apply an unitary uh, operation on it, uh, it does not change the number. So, in particular, if you have a quantum state that has uh, is a as you saw, is a unit vector in some Hilbert space, and you apply a unit operation, then uh, you you keep you you still have a quantum state because the norm of this quantum state of, of this new state is uh, of, of this new vector is still one. So that's what I just said, and a second very important remark is that. Why we have these quantum measurements that collapse the quantum state, right? And you decided to measure, and then you have this collapse and you lost information. Uh, unit operations, they have an image, right? By definition. So when you apply unit operations, you have no loss of information. Okay, so a, a quantum algorithm is just a, a, a applying this unit operation and then doing a measurement at the end, and then the, second, the only part that is destructive, like the only part where information is being lost, is the second part where I have measurements. Because this first part where I have unitaries, then one can in principle undo it. Okay? And of course, uh, when we're talking about uh, like classical operations, you, you, you don't think about uh, like computation as a whole. You, you break this uh, computation in, in elementary gates, and that's the same thing that we do in quantum, right? So instead of having big unitaries, we first consider like these small uh, gates, uh, these small quantum gates, and you compose them to, to, to give us a bigger quantum shape. And just to give an example of uh, quantum gates, so the simplest one is the X gate, the call is just uh, the quantum version of not. So it maps zero to one and one to zero. But on top of that, it, it acts, okay, okay, it's just a linear operation. So it, it, uh, it is also defined for different quantum states, for example, the quantum state plus. And when we show, for example, X applied, well, like if you apply uh, this operation X onto the state plus, then you, you keep your state plus, but then if you apply X to the state minus, then uh, you, you have a minus phase uh, minus on this point. So this is just so. This is just uh, like how, how we have the not gate in the quantum setting. And uh, we have several other quantum gates. So for example, we have the the not, but in the in the in the plus minus basis. So the Z, what we call Z gate, is just one zero zero minus one, and now it maps plus to minus and minus to plus. So, so this is somehow applying the not gate, but in these different bases, right? Because uh, it's just swapping between these basic states. And again, you can uh, see how this uh, Z gate it, uh, it behaves in this canonical, like uh, in the canonical basis. But uh, more interesting things start when we start combining or start uh, uh, having unitaries that allows to change bases. And uh, for this, the most important uh, quantum gate that you have is the Hadamard matrix. And the Hadamard gate is the, the, is the gate that will allow us to map from zero to plus and plus to zero. So, so when, when you have this, uh, uh, that, uh, uh,
Oh. 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 So the hardware gate, oh, okay. the hardware gate is the one that will allow us to, to flip from this uh, zero on the basis to the plus minus thing. So it will have zero to plus and one to minus. And uh, this is important because this is allowing us to, to, to go from one element, like this computational basis state, that is easy, like it is a classical state, so it's not zero, you have no superposition. So you can see it's just a classical state. And applying the Hadamard, it, go, uh, it allows us to move from this classical state to this superposition over two classical states. Like we we're going to from one classical state to the superposition of different uh, classical states. And uh, this allows us to somehow explore the superposition power of our composition. Okay? And the same thing from one. Like from one you, you also explore this position, but now with the final space of life. Okay. okay. And then and you have many other gates, but uh, okay, I, I won't just spend all the time here explaining them. Uh, but uh, I think the main the main gates that, that we need for at least for just one qubits, these are the ones. And just to go back to, to the experiment that I explained before, let's just now, like, now that you have the basis for quantum computing, at least for quantum mechanics, uh, I think we're now where we're at level, let's explain what's happening there. And uh, to explain it, we can define that, uh, for example, when the photons are moving in the, uh, like to the right, we call it the quantum state zero. And let's say that when they're moving up, there we have the quantum state one. Okay, so we have like the quantum state now is encoded by, by this by the, the direction of, of, of your upper box. So here we start with the quantum state uh, Z. And then uh, we can model like this beam splitter as this uh, the Hadamard matrix. So it's going to have zero to zero plus one. Okay, so that's what we saw. We saw. Like the, the, the operation of the of the, of the Hadamard matrix is going from this uh, initial state zero to the universe proposition of zero and one. Then, uh, <laughs> then uh, when you apply the mirrors, then we're just applying this x gate, so it flips zero and one between each other. But when you apply zero, like when you map zero to one and one to zero. This, uh, this state remains unchanged. So, so when you apply these two mirrors, then uh, they, say, uh, they say that you have here is the same as before because, because just this state is invariant to the X state. And finally, we apply this uh, last uh, Hadamard gate and uh, the Hadamard gate, it maps uh, the plus state to the zero state. So after, you have the plus state here, and you apply the hammer again, you, you're back to the zero state, and that's why here we measure 100% of the functions. Okay, so this is just a, a way that it's just, just a, you know, it's nice to go back and say that, okay, this is why quantum is happening. So somehow you're going, instead of having half of the photos come here and half of the photos come here, what it happens is that you have a superposition of photos, half in Z here, half in here. And then, if you measure at this time, then you see uh, fifty percent and fifty percent, because that's what happens if you measure zero plus one uh, in, in, the, in the computational basis. But if you apply the Hadamard uh, sorry, or the bit feature or the Hadamard again, then you go back to zero, and then hundred percent of the, the of the photon will be on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you can. Uh, there is this uh, experience for for quantum veracity called called bottle sampling, and this this really plays what this 
bean spirits are doing, why they are, and, 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 and this could become a very, very hard problem on how like, to, to decide where the, or, where, what to be the output of, of this circuit. This is just a toy symbol example. Okay. Questions? So everything I said now is uh, so far is about one qubit, but with one qubit you cannot do anything, right? The, the, the important part is that you can have multiple qubits in parallel. Instead of having like just one qubit, you can put a lot of them in parallel. And uh, instead of having like this two dimensional of the space, like you have the tensor product of these two dimensional spaces, and this is equivalent to having this two to the n dimension of the word space. Okay, so the idea is that if you have n qubits, then you can explore a two to the n dimension of the space. And your quantum state that now is just uh, the superposition over all possible n bit strings of alpha i with the quantum state i. Like you can think about uh, the i being the i uh, canonical basis vector. And uh, again, we need a quantum state to be a unit vector in the silver space. So we need all of these alpha i's to be complex. And the sum over their normal strings to be equal to one. Okay, so the, the key point is going from F one to n is that you, you have now this uh, exponential law up in the, in the Hilbert dimension, like sorry, in the dimension of the Hilbert space. But uh, <coughs> if you change things uh, like accordingly, this it has a same, it's the same concept that we saw before, but the, now in this uh, much bigger dimension. Uh, to describe our, our quantum information, right? Sorry? Qubits describe our information. Yeah. 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 How, how, for, yeah. how information is stored. Yeah. Questions about uh, having multiple qubits? Yeah. What are the I? Oh, I are all possible in this room. So before, okay, before, uh, no. So I defined uh, zero as one zero and one as um, zero one, right? And now I'm just generalizing it by having all zero states. Is there one zero zero? And what do we have about two to the end one? Dimensional vector. And then, for example, if you have zero and the last you have a one, then we state zero, one, and all zero. So for every bit string, you have one of these canonical bases. And uh, so and so you can define two to the end of one. Okay, so up to uh, all ones. And this will be zero, 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 up to a one. Here. Okay, so this gives uh, two to the n, two to the n basis states. And the state phi, you give, like you assign this uh, amplitude of phi to each one of these, uh, of these basis states. Uh, Respecting the fact that uh, the sum of alpha I squared uh, of the norm of alpha I squared has to be one. Okay, and then your qubit is to be the superposition over potentially all of these basis states. Okay, and this is uh, this is why Richard Feynman in 1984 he claimed or he conjectured that the classical computers cannot simulate quantum systems. Is because in some sense you have to okay in the naive way you have to store all of these two to the n dimension uh, like these two to the n values in order to, to take care of the evolution of this quantum system. Like if you have a if you have an n qubit system, then you have two to the n dimensional um, space that you need to, to to store, 
and these would be untractable for for possible engineers. Okay. Continue. So I just explained uh, briefly explained how to generalize uh, like from one qubit to n qubits, but now I can start about uh, talking about which type of measurements you can do in this n qubit quantum state. And uh, again, what you can do here is by fix this uh, key to the end, like this two to the end vectors that form a basis. Or some normal basis for the silver space. And when you measure the state psi according to that basis, then you have an outcome uh, this thing pi i with the corresponding probability uh, the normal of the i squared. And again, after you do this measurement, you have this outcome, the state will collapse to, to, to the basis state pi i, and then you lost all the information that you have in this range. Okay. So now instead of having just these two branches, you have two to the end ones, and you collapse just to one of them. And uh, for the evolution of quantum states, uh, it's the same thing. Like now we have like this unitary matrix, but now over this two to the end uh, uh, dimension of Hilbert space. And uh, the point is, you can decompose, as I said, you can decompose these uh, big unitaries according uh, using um, one and multiple qubit gates. So for example, you can have gates that act on two or more qubits, and you compose them by applying them in parallel. So then you apply them using the central product, or you can apply them sequentially, where you multiply just matrix multiplication. So you, you, you can define a circuit where you have different gates. So we have like in one in two, for example, and then they are in the bottom. Or you have any, for example, can compose sequentially to take in three. And uh, by composing multiple gates like this, you, 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 you can construct a quantum circuit that will act on, on uh, let's say, n qubits. And uh, it could, for example, solve a fat turning or solve any other problem that, that you might want. Okay, but the important part is that you don't need to store all of these two million dimensional objects. <coughs> is that you, uh, the, the idea that instead of that, you decompose it in smaller gates and you compose them to solve their problem. That, that, that's how, how you do it in classical computing, but also in quantum. Yeah. And uh, okay, this is the a brief. A very quick way of uh, the explaining the basics of quantum computing, but just from there we can have uh, multiple applications for for it. For for example, we can use this universe superposition, like this this, uh, this possibility of, of going to superposition of quantum states to to solve different problems. For example, factoring or solving linear systems of equation, and even like the, the, the initial motivation of Hyman that simulating quantum system. But you can also use it for, for cryptography. So there is this way of hiding information in this basis that is uh, very important, for example, for quantum distribution, or you can have a protocols for gener generating random values that are verifiable. So I can give some values to you that I can prove that they are random. Uh, we, we can analyze topics for, for, for complexity here. So, so for example, we can uh, study uh, the quantum version of NP and trying to understand what are the complete problems for that. And um, yeah, it can, it can go in different directions. We can study information theory, you can uh, state game, you study game theory. So, so it's really, I think, every, every copy that can study in classical computing, you can try to understand what happens in the quantum setting with quantum resources. On that. And my goal today is to present two of them. So I want to explain a bit how to use these properties of quantum state with quantum distribution. Uh, and if I have time, I'll also talk a bit about the uh, non locality and value inequalities. This is uh, uh, this, um, what, what uh, Einstein said uh, the spooky notion of like 
the spookiness of quantum, of quantum mechanics. It comes from his uh, Bellamy qualities. And uh, I, have, I, have, I have half an hour. I thought that I could talk a bit about the uh, QMA and local Hamiltonians, but I, I probably I won't have time for that. But uh, yeah, if there are no other questions, then I'll, I'll talk a bit about how, how to use this, these uh, building blocks that I mentioned to, 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 to actually see some things in practice, like how, how, how we can use them to, to have concrete applications uh, for quantum photography or for, for the interior. Any question? Just a naive question. So quantum algorithm, basically you choose a gate. And then you have a result and you measure it and you get with some probability some other. So, so it depends. Uh, so the, the point is uh, one of the big problems of quantum of doing quantum operations is that measurements they 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 destroy they destroy mm -hmm. information, right? So the point is you have to pick the gates in such a way that the measurement will give even if it destroys, it gives you some useful information. So for example, one of these algorithms, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into too much details, but uh, for, for one of these algorithms, you have, let's say, you have a function. Let's say they have a function f. Uh, but let's say maps uh, bits. No, sorry, n bits to n bits. And let's say that uh, there exists an X, an X, or some value S, such that F of X is equal to F of Y, if and only if Y is X or X XOR S. So there is this secret value S, such that these two values, like the, the function will have the same if you on if x and x x or s okay or to be different if, if, if it has not have this structure so what can be shown that there is a way of uh, having picking this quantum gates and r box with f that you're given samples of uh, of value y sorry value z so you can get samples of z1 up to z p such that z i dot s equals zero. So again, your product between z i and s equals zero. So there is a quantum algorithm that gives us this. So it's not really giving us the answer, but it allows us to collect <coughs> to many things. You can solve, solve these linear system applications and find s. Okay, so then the, the key point is how, how can you have this quantum algorithm that output these guys, then you have to use this superposition and study a bit of Fourier spectrum of, of it. But, but then uh, one, one can, it's not too hard to calculate. Uh, I, can, uh, I can talk about this offline or other examples of line, but there is how to, usually it's about Fourier spectrum. So, so you have to solve problems where the Fourier coefficients gives us some, some part of the answer. And then, and then you use the information to, to solve the problem as well. Okay, I can talk about later. Other questions? So let me talk a bit about quantum distribution. And the idea here is that Alice and Bob, they're talking over the phone, and they want to find this. Uh, Common random k that uh, they know that uh, like they, they agree on this value k, but what they want is that nobody else in the world know about this what, what the value of k is. Okay, and uh, and they don't they're not together in the same place, so they they have to talk on the phone. But uh, the problem is uh, they want to be secure, even if e. She's eavesdropping the conversation. For example, she has she can tamper with the, the communication and she can hear everything that Alice and Bob are saying. So Alice could not just tell Bob, here's the value K, because then in this case, E, she would learn it, and then the, the security will be compromised. Okay, so just to, uh, uh, to summarize, 
that's about they want to value, to find some value k, and they want don't want e that is able to eavesdrop the, the, the communication to learn the value of k. And uh, what's important is that, like, one can easily show that using classical information, so using just classical communication, it's not possible for Alice and Bob to information theoretically secure find this, uh, this uh, like to, to agree on this common key. Okay? So th th this can be shown, and the idea is that everything that Bob is learning, Ab is also learning. So, so the, if, if Bob is able to find the key, Ab is, can, can do the same thing as, as Bob in order to, to learn it somehow. And uh, the idea is that we, this uh, possibility relies on the fact that the, uh, the, the information exchanged, like the possibility relies on the fact that uh, Alice and Bob, they, they communicate classically. So we can now study what happens if Alice and Bob now they can communicate via quantum state. So if they can send quantum states back and forth uh, between them. And uh, there are two important properties that, uh, that will be useful to us. So the first one is that measurements, they collapse the quantum state. So this is the weakness that we saw, like uh, we're losing information, but this, uh, this is a key, uh, this would be a key point where Alice and Bob, they can check if someone else is eavesdropping their quantum communication. Because if they were eavesdropping, if you're measuring, so if you're gaining information from it, then collapse must happen. And uh, the second uh, property of quantum states that's important for that, is that uh, quantum, it's impossible to copy quantum states. And uh, this is, there is a simple proof for that. So imagine that there is a unitary that is able to copy quantum states. So this unitary on state psi and zero is of this psi psi. Okay, let's assume that such a unitary exists. Then, uh, then we can just study what happens if you try to copy plus and zero. Oh, sorry, if you want to copy plus. So this unitary on plus and zero, it should uh, output plus and plus. But uh, by linearity, you can, you can just uh, rewrite plus as zero plus one. So we can just uh, decompose, like rewrite plus as a sum of zero and one. And by the, uh, you, you, can, you can arrive to the conclusion that the, the outcome of, uh, of, of this topic is not plus and plus, but this is quantum state zero, zero plus one, one, that's different from plus plus. And plus plus is just zero, zero, plus zero, one, plus one, zero, plus one, one. So, yeah, the punchline is that <laughs> one can show that it's impossible, like by, by the rules of quantum mechanics, one can show that it's impossible to copy quantum states. This is the punchline. Okay? And, um, and, 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 and this is important to, uh, for example, it, it, for this in particular, for this, for Alice, oh, sorry, for F, when, when Alice wants to send a quantum state to, to, to Bob, F, she cannot just copy the quantum state, keep one copy of it, and send the other one to Bob. She has to do some operation on it. Like she, she cannot just perfectly copy them and having one of these copies and send the other one to Bob. So, so this uh, point two is important to prevent this type of attack. <laughs> and okay, as I said, so yeah, the goal is that now using these two properties of quantum states, we can uh, have a protocol where Alice can send a quantum state to Bob, and if she's trying to read information from the quantum state, she's collapsing it. And in this case, Alice and Bob they, they check that F was it's dropping. And uh, and this and, and hopefully this can give us a protocol where Alice and Bob they can uh, create a like they, they can share common quantum sorry share con, uh, key that's unknown by any uh, extractor. Okay, is it clear what what the goal what the, our goal is? No. Yeah. What well, well, can she share the key if we cannot be okay. So then for, okay. The, what cannot be duplicated is this quantum state. Yeah. The key is a classical value, and this is uh, like you can copy quantum classical states. 
So the only thing that you realize is that this conductive side cannot be copied. This is the only thing. But then if when he oh no no okay and then okay the protocol has other other rounds where we have class permutation. Okay. And the point is you send this first quantum state, then, then you have our ideas that you cannot copy, that add, uh, like if she's jobs, she's, she's uh, disturbing it and so on. And then you have classical rounds of communication that, per, that allow Alice and Bob to, 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 to compute the key together. Okay, I, I will be more concrete. So, and, and, um, yeah, after the second next slide, if, you, if it's not clear, then you ask again. Okay. okay. Yeah, how do we check when the state collapse? Do you have to measure it? Do you understand that it's collapsed? Uh, again, uh, I'll explain the protocol. And, uh, and if it's not clear then, then you ask me, okay? So yeah, maybe I should be more concrete now. So let, let me describe the protocol. And uh, we have Alice and Bob. And uh, the protocol starts by Alison as choosing a bay, uh, cho choosing random states between 0, 1, plus and one. Okay, let's say she picks lambda of them, or lambda from the six. So she picks, let's say, plus, zero, one, zero, minus one. So she just picked them at random. And after she picks it, she can just uh, put, uh, put the basis for, for each one of the common states. So she, she puts a one if it's in the plus minus basis or a zero if it's in compression basis. Okay, this is just, uh, like she knows what state she created. So she can just keep a uh, book keep the basis that was chosen. Okay. So, so far, and it's just chose for two states and uh, we keep this information about the basis just for it to be helpful for us later. And then Alice, she sends the quantum state corresponding like this quantum uh, this qubit that she picked in the front of the random and send, sends them to Bob. Bob? Oops. Bob, on his side, he receives a quantum state. He doesn't know what it is like Alice she picked everything from private randoms that she has. So Bob, he picks bases in from that random, and he decides to measure each qubit according to this randomly chosen basis that he, that he picked. Okay. So for example, he picked uh, the first basis to be in the Hadar basis, like in the plus minus basis. So if he measures plus in the plus minus basis, the outcome is plus with where you want. He decided to measure the second qubit, so that's zero in the plus minus basis. So the outcome is minus, and it happened with what you have, but Bob does not know at this point. He's just choosing basis and using this basis to measure these qubits. Okay, some of the some of the times when, when by chance Bob's basis matches um, Alice's basis, then the outcome is deterministic, otherwise, it's just a random value. Uh, Independent of, of, of the state chosen by us. Is it clear? Program? Yeah, I didn't understand the second step. Of so, why is the basis different for Bob? No, okay. Bob, the point is, Bob didn't know the basis. He doesn't know anything about this private one that is chose. So, he picked fresh new basis. So he just chooses basis, and he, is, he measures the qubit sent by Alice using this basis, using this basis. Okay, the point is nobody at this point, like when Alice sends the message, nobody except her knows who, who which are the correct basis. Okay, and this is very important. When you put Eve in the, in the picture, this will be very important. So the point is, some of the bases of Bob will be wrong, but half of them should be correct, right? If he picks them in from at random, then half of the bases will be correct. And in this case, the outcome that he has are deterministic, right? Because if Alice, if, if Alice creates something in the, in the plus minus basis, 
and Bob decides to measure the flow time phases, then the outcome cannot be right? So the flood, like, if nothing happened in this uh, communication, then the outcomes should be the same qubit at a cell. But sometimes they pick Bob picks a different basis from what Alice had. And in this case, crowd, uh, his outcome will just, will just be a random value. But we'll see how, how they will come out of it. But is it clear at least for now what, what's happening? Like Bob is just uh, picking, base, picking random bases and measuring the qubits. And some of the values are, are good, some of, some of them are not, but uh, we'll see how, how they will, they will, they will follow the protocol. So far, so good. Then what Bob will, will, will tell Alice is here are the bases that I chose. You tell, I measure the first one in the half in the plasma basis, the second one in the plasma basis, the third one in the professional basis, and so forth. And in this case, Alice, she knows which are the bases of the quantum state that she, that, 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 that she sent. So we, she can, not, at least with this information, she can compute which are the bases that match and which are the bases that are, they do not match. Okay, so Alice can, uh, at this time, she can compute this. And she can uh, tell her bases to Bob. So Bob will also know which are, the, which are the bases that match and which are the bases that do not match. But importantly, what Alice would tell, she should pick a sub regarding the bases that match, like the positions whose base, base match. Alice will pick a random subset of it and ask Bob to send the outcome of his measurements on this random subset. So for example, here we have the position one, three, four, and six, uh, like these bases match. And Alice tell, ask Bob, give me the outcomes of her measurement for position one and four. And then Bob tells, okay, position one, my outcome is plus, position four, my outcome is zero. And then Alice, she knows which is the state that she sent. She, she knows that she sent a plus, she knows that she sent a zero. And then in this case, since the outcomes reported by Bob are the same that the outcomes that like the state that she created, she accepts that uh, she, she accepts uh, that uh, nobody was tampering with the communication. And then, then they can use the other qubits, the ones that are not revealed, as the key, the secret key that Alice and Bob they can share. So in particular, they can, uh, if Alice accepts here, they can use the position zero, sorry, the, the, the position three and the position six to create two bits of key that nobody else should know. Okay, so for example, here the, the key would be one one. So okay, this is one, and this is one in the other in the plus minus space. Yeah. yeah. If one to uh, change a secret to a key, it's just avoid from measuring from the minimum. Isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Because when you talk about the key distribution, you are not going to point to uh, someone to give me. But you, you want to see if someone is given because if you also measure it, so the value will change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, talk about, yeah I'll, I'll talk about the attack in the next slide. Yeah, yeah. But, but this is the case. Like, the point is, if someone is reading to this information, then the last something should be different in the last in the last round. And in this case, they know that uh, that they cannot continue because someone was tempered with it. But what, what can improve is that if, if all the values are correct, then with high probability, no one was uh, listened to it. And then their, their keys are secret enough. And then there are more complicated things that we can do to modify the secret, like the secrecy. Okay? But uh, yeah, I'm not telling the whole picture here. I'm just in a simplified way of how, how to do the distribution, a very simplified way. Yeah, but within the 
second uh, transmission from Bob, she knows that some of the uh, bases, some of the box bases are right. Couldn't they directly choose? We are going to choose the one, three, four, six, four, four base. But then they don't know if someone was. But the point is, uh, they don't know if someone knows uh, also the information. Okay, so they, they want two things. They want to know if uh, they want to have a common key and they want to prove that nobody else knows it. Okay, just by, by having a common, like just by having the common basis, it's not telling that, uh, that uh, first of all, that the key is the same. Because if someone was here measuring it, the keys wouldn't be the same. And secondly, by just telling what the bases are, it's not telling that nobody was listening to it, right? Because this is just like if someone could have. Take the mistake and replace by something completely different, and the bases will be the same. And then they would say, "Oh, we can use these positions, but we, we're not even sure that these positions are right." No, okay, you have it's not clear, right? Yeah. Okay. No. It does or not? It does. Okay, it's just about this. You you have you have to guarantee it. For example, someone did it, took like was tempered, like took the state out and put something else in. And they, they pass the test. Like, you still need to check it. In this case, that they cannot accept because the, the, they cannot share the same thing in this case. But then, what happens if somebody else took again in the third communication, they took the key again and oh, put their okay. key? Or we assume that class communication is uh, authentic. Authentic. Okay, so the class part, the dropper can read it, but it cannot tamper with Like, you know, it cannot change it. The, the adversary can change the first one. Yeah. Uh, what are the G uh, on the next building? Uh, these are the bases from bottom. Like B's, the okay. BIs are the bases for Alice. Oh, I don't know. No, no, no. No, no. B tilde are the bases of Alice. Sorry. BIs are the bases of. Bob and B I tildes are the base of Alice. So it's not different from the P is the quantum state, oh. right? P is zero, one, plus and minus. And if you have zero or one, then B I will be Z B I tilde will be zero. If you have plus and minus, then B I tilde will be one. Questions? So let me just so let let's have a very simple attack that I, that Alice uh, sorry that F does, and the simple attack is that F will pick some bases and measure the qubits on these chosen bases. Right. So this is a very simple attack. So this, I'm not claiming it's the most general attack. But let's just see what happens in this case. So let's say that uh, F, uh, she picks one zero one 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 zero as basis, and she measures the state according to this basis. And again, sometimes the outcomes are deterministic, but sometimes the outcomes are randomized. When, in particular, when the basis uh, of Alice and Eve are different. So when these bases are different. So uh, this changes, so by doing a measurement, uh, F is changing the quantum state. So F in the third position, she sent a one, but F she measured in the plus <coughs> phases and she had outcome plus. So the, the one that you have here became a plus. And the other right one is the same thing, like here F send a zero. Sorry, F send a zero. F, she measured the plus minus basis and the outcome of minus, and so the zero became minus, and so on. So, half of the positions F has disturbed the quantum state. Uh, and then, uh, when, Be when Bob performs his measurement, so he chooses a base at random, and he has some outcomes, but not the outcomes 
they depend on the pulse measurement state like after F changes this quantum state, then it will determine which are the values that Bob has here. So in particular, there is one position where Bob and Alice they have they have chosen the same basis, but the outcome that Bob has is different of the state that Alice said because it was changed by uh, it was changed by M. Okay, so the, the point that F was measuring these qubits one by one disturbed the quantum state in such a way that there is a position where Alice and Bob's position should agree, but they do not. So they follow the protocol, and at some point, Bob, uh, let's say that Alice chose the uh, position one and four, and Bob sends one uh, plus and one, but Alice says, oh, in position four, I sent qubit zero, and Bob measured a one. So something, something happened here. So there's some someone listened to our communication, so we cannot securely create our random key. Uh, yeah, in, in, we cannot create this random key in a secure way. What if by chance E gets the right basis all the time, or uh, the chose even Bob chose the same basis? So okay, so that's why okay, six is not a good number. You have to have lambda. Lambda is a security parameter. So the probability that he chooses the right basis, it, it will be negligible, right? It should be exponentially small in lambda. And, uh, and the point is, lambda should be big enough such that when E is doing something non negligible, then Alice and Bob, they, 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 will, they will notice that. And when it's too small, like, so for example, E could just pick one of the bases and measure it, right? So one can show that uh, she can gain some information, but it's almost known, so that's why I just said it's a very simplified version of the protocol because then there are other other parts of the protocol that where you have amplified uh, amplify secrecy. So, so the idea is that if all the tests pass, then Alice and Bob they know that they have a secret knot key, and they can have a, a second part of the protocol where they distill. Completely secure keys from this secret and not key. And this is by just random extraction, if, if you know that. Like applying an extraction, that then you, you, you can have a key that's independent of, of, of this previous key that has an object here. Okay, I have another question. Uh, so we assume that it, it cannot happen that E listens after Bob has uh, done his measurements. Uh, in that case, no, no, she, you know, she can listen to everything, but she cannot modify the classical messages. She, she listens to everything, yes. but she cannot modify it. No, no, but in the first uh, communication, ah, oh. if Bob has done his measurements. Ah, then, then the quantum that... state is gone. Like the point is, the quantum, there's no copy of quantum state, so Alice sends it to Bob. Mm -hmm. So while it's sending, like in the process of sending, F could intercept it. Mm -hmm. but after Bob reaches it, like, or it reaches Bob, then she has no access. Okay. So yeah, you have a question. If you, you have a, you had a question before, like did it it's, is it more clear now? It is more clear. I think Caholi also. So, so so the point is like this collapse will be checked like here late, later on. So so it's not a so you have you have a very specific how to check this collapse. But this is a concrete way of doing that. Yeah. But if Eve didn't touch it at all and tried to figure it out by the numbers of Bob and Ellis submitted, could no, they backtrace it? No, 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 no. The point is, uh, if, if Eve does not touch this quantum state, then all these, uh, like there are two remaining positions, I think it was three and six. The information about these two positions never appeared. Then. Uh, so this is completely secret. That's why we choose three and six. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because that's why you have to discard, for example, one and four, because this information is here. So if you learn from it, so we just keep the things that are never discussed in the, in the, private, in the public chat. And as I said, this is a very simplified 
protocol and attack. So that there could be many more nasty things that it could do. And we have a security proof that formally shows that if she's doing something, then either Bob and Alice they, they realize that or they can this is not important enough and they can steal a secret key from that anyway. Okay. But uh, this requires much more advanced techniques. And as I said, okay, and then also, yeah, there are more, more important, like uh, practical relevant, practical relevant uh, uh, properties of protocol as well. For example, quantum uh, technologies, they are very noisy. So how it could uh, deal with noise in the protocol as well? So you need uh, protocols that are fault tolerant. And then uh, this can be dealt with, but then the protocols become more and more complicated. And also protocols that are more suitable for implementation. So for here, all I described and all that I know mostly is about discrete variables, quantum computing, but there is something called continuous variable quantum computing. And things get many more, much more complicated, but they're physically they're easier to implement. So then people have studied these protocols in this continuous variable setting as well. Or also one, one very interesting setting is device independent protocols where Alice and Bob, they have some quantum apparatus, but they don't trust the apparatus. So the only thing that they trust is that the, the interface that they have with this, with this quantum device. So they just press a button and they have an outcome commit. And just by these two classical values, like the button that you press and the outcome that it has, you, you can, you can uh, derive uh, secret, secret keys from that. And uh, as I said, there are products in the market for, for QKD. So there are more, yeah, there are not a lot of people buying them, but uh, you can in principle. Uh, and the point is like, yeah, every time that you need to, like in order to implement QKD, you need a special cable, a special communication between two points. So this, uh, this is much less um, desirable than having, I don't know, some in the internet to exchange keys at some every, uh, all the time to do, I don't know, uh, Secure communication, but now under computational assumptions. But uh, but for QKD, we would need to for every person that we want to exchange a key with, we have to have a, a special dedicated channel. We have to have special devices. So it's not uh, so it has a very specific purpose. It's not for a bread and butter uh, key exchange that we need every day. And uh, what is interesting is that these key ideas of QKD, they're also used to, to in protocols for, for different uh, primitives. For example, uh, what I said about unclonable schemes for unclonable quantum money. So you have quantum bills that uh, cannot be cloned, or you can use it to have protocols where you can certify that someone deleted your information. And even people are using it to study uh, using quantum status programs. And you can prove that this program cannot be uh, cloned. So you cannot create two copies of the same one. And I wanted to talk about the inequalities, but I think we're completely out of time. Yeah, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, the inequalities, they're just the ways of. Uh, But like what they used to prove in theory or prove in practice that the world is not possible. So there is a way of having our, again, this Alice and Bob that are far apart. There is a way of uh, having games that uh, if, you, if you pass, like if you have some the fixed winning probability, it means that the world is not possible. And then this was used by Alan Asperi back in 82, in the first time like this violation of binary qualities to somehow have some indication that uh, Okay, this does not, does not prove that the world is quantum, but at least uh, it's more than classical. And then back uh, like uh, six years ago, like uh, there was this first uh, loophole free version of the experiment. And this really was a stone over discussion. So indeed uh, the world is not classical and uh, we, we have an experiment that tells us that without any loophole. And unfortunately I couldn't explain this thing, but um, you can talk to me in the coffee break. And yeah, 
<laughs> I also hope to talk about this. It's quite beautiful. And this is for my research, like is the quantum version of NP. So yeah, I find it very interesting, but I'm very biased. Um, but the conclusion is that uh, there are many things to explore in quantum computing. I think, um, yeah. I think, I think if you're interested, I think uh, there, there are common projects that that, uh, um, that that touch your research field and quantum. And in particular, uh, uh, there is this appel project ellipsis that uh, I think last two years ago, I think Tassos and uh, Fred, uh, they had a project that uh, now you have a PhD student on that. Last year, uh, Damien and I, we had a project where we started doing like a quantum, like a, a project on quantum crypto. And now we have a PhD student on that. So I think if, if you want to start doing quantum, I think this is a good uh, entry point. And, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs>